are you 12? This is the solutions to the 2022 extension to HSC maths paper. In this first video, we're going to look at the multiple choice questions. Question one, let R be the region in the complex plane defined by the real part of Z is in between one and three, including three. And the argument of Z is in between pi on six and pi on three, including pi on six, which means this question comes down to, is it a dotted line or a solid line? which is a stupid question in my humble opinion, but nonetheless. So we want a solid line at x equals three, which means that D is out and B is out, and we want a dotted line at one. Then we want a solid line pi on six, which is here, and C is out, so the answer is A. Question two. The following proof aims to establish that negative four is equal to zero. At which line is the implication incorrect? So let's go through it. Let a equal negative four. Therefore, a squared is equal to 16, that's true, and four a plus four is equal to negative 12, true. Now we're adding both of these together. a squared plus four a plus four is equal to 16, take away 12, which is four, correct. The left-hand side can be factorized into a plus two all squared, and the right hand side is equal to two squared. So line three is correct. And here's the problem, isn't it? Because when we do the square root, we need to consider that it could be plus or minus two. So the problem is at line four. Question three, let A, B, P be three points in three dimensional space and A is unequal to B. Consider the following statement. If P is on the line A, B, there exists a real number lambda such that AP is equal to lambda AB, which of the following is the contrapositive of this statement. So remember with contrapositive, we want to switch these around and negate both of them. Now the negation of there exists is for all. For all real numbers lambda, AP, we want the negation, will not equal lambda AB. And that will imply the negation of this P is not on the line. Okay, let's have a look at A. If for all real numbers, AP is equal, that's not that, it's not A. B, if for all real numbers, AP is not equal to lambda AB, P is not on the line, it's a B, isn't it? Question four. Of the following expressions, which one need not contain a term involving a logarithm in its antiderivative? Bit of a nasty question we've got to go through every single one okay with a i can see the main parts of the derivative of x squared plus 4x plus 5 sitting on the numerator so that one is going to be a log so that's gone this one here can i factorize that denominator so we're going to have x 5 and 1 minus 5 plus 1. I can do partial fractions on this and they will involve logs, so gone. This one here, let's have a look at this denominator. We've got, factorise the first, 2 plus x minus 1 is equal to x minus 1 over x squared plus 1 x minus 1. And they cancel and I end up with 1 over x squared plus 1, which is inverse tan. So our answer is C. Question 5. If the integral between a and x of f of t dt is equal to g of x, which of the following is a primitive of f of x g of x? So if we want a primitive of this, that means the derivative of each of these is going to be equal to that. So I'm going to start off by differentiating these all of these with respect to x, just using the chain rule. So our two comes down, so we've got one times f of x times the derivative of the inside function, which is gonna be f dashed of x. Now they're all gonna follow the same pattern. In the second case, we're gonna end up with a half times two of f dashed of x times f double dashed of x. And then this one is going to be g of x times g dashed of x, and the last one will be g dashed of x times g double dashed of x. Okay, now let's do something with this. If we've got the integral of between a and x 
of f of t dt is equal to g of x, then this is what we can say, that the primitive of this, so the antiderivative, using fundamental theorem of calculus, this is going to be f of x take away f of a, and I've used capital F to show that that is the antiderivative, is equal to g of x. Now, if I work out g dashed of x, I'm going to end up with, this will go back to being little f, and this guy will become zero. Okay, now in all of these, I'm looking for f of x, g of x. I'm not going to get it there. A is out. And I'm not going to get it there. B is out. I am going to get it here, because this is g of x times g dashed of x, which is f of x. So this one is equal to g of x, f of x. So our answer is C. Question six. It is known that a particular complex number z is not a real number. So y is not equal to zero. Which of the following could be true for this number z? We're going to have to go through all of them, aren't we? So let's start with a. So conjugate of z is x minus i y, and i z is equal to i x minus y, which is equal to minus y plus i x. Could we have a situation where x is equal to negative y and negative y is equal to x? Well, yes, we could, couldn't we? Could, we could say z is equal to 2 minus 2i. And conjugate of z would be 2 plus 2i. And iz would equal 2i take away 2i times i, which is 2i plus 2, which is 2 plus 2i. Wow, it's a. Question 7. Consider the statement. For all integers n greater than or equal to 1, if n is prime, then n multiplied by n plus 1 divided by 2 is also prime. Which of the following is true about the statement and its converse? Okay, so let's have a look at the statement first. If n is prime, then this is also prime. Let's check it out. Let's say n is equal to 3. 3 times 4 over 2 is equal to 6. That is not prime. So the statement is not true. So we can get rid of a and c. Now let's consider the converse. n brackets n plus 1 divided by 2 being prime. Interesting, because this divide by 2 means that it's going to have a factor of 2. So the only way this could be prime is if n is equal to 2. Isn't that right? So 2 over 2 multiplied by 3, which is equal to 3, which is prime. So in that case, then n is prime, so the converse is true. The answer is D. Question 8. As a projectile of mass m kilograms travels through the air, it experiences a frictional force. The magnitude of this force is proportional to the square of the speed v of the projectile. Constant of proportionality is the positive number k. Position of the particle at time t is denoted by the vector xy. Acceleration due to gravity is g meters per second squared. Based on Newton's laws of motion, which equation models the motion of this projectile? So we want to use Newton's second law, and then we want to look at the forces that are acting on this object. So we have got a frictional force, so it's working against it, so negative kv squared, and we've also got gravity. Now we're going to write it in vector form, so m x dot dot y dot dot is equal to negative k, you can see how we don't have a squared here and here and here and here. So we're going to split one of those v's out like this. And then finally, we're writing this particular force also in vector form. So that's going to be 0 because it doesn't act on the horizontal and then mg. So which one is it? Let's see. It is b, isn't it? Question 9. Let A and B be two distinct points in three-dimensional space, and let M be the midpoint of AB. 
let S1 be the set of all points P such that AP dot BP is equal to zero. So that's going to be a sphere. I'm going to just draw it in 2D. But it'll look like this. And it's going to be P. And we know that this angle here is going to be a right angle. Let S2 be the set of all points N such that AN or the magnitude of AN is equal to magnitude of MN. So that's going to be a line through here. That's N there. So that distance equals that distance there. The intersection of S1 and S2 is the circle S. What is the radius of the circle S? So hard to draw on the screen, but because S1 is a sphere and S2 is actually going to be, well, where they intersect is going to be a circle. It's going to be like a slice of this sphere. I don't know if that makes sense to you. It's going to look like that as we go through. I'm just going to rub that out because it's making it too complicated. So basically, in that circle, this is going to be the radius here. So we just need to work that out. And we know that's going to be a right angle there. Now, we want everything in terms of AB. So this distance here is AB on 2. And so this one here, let's go around here, it's going to be AB on 4. And this is a radius of the circle, so that is AB on two. So we can just use Pythagoras' theorem. So x squared is going to be equal to AB, magnitude of AB on two, all squared. Take away AB, magnitude, on four, all squared, which is equal to AB squared on four, take away AB squared on 16, which is equal to four lots of AB squared, take away one lot, running out of room, which is equal to three AB squared on 16. And when we do the square root of that, we're gonna get root three, magnitude AB on four, so the answer is D. Question 10. A particle is moving vertically in a resistive medium under the influence of gravity. The resistive force is proportional to the velocity of the particle. The initial speed of the particle is not zero. Which of the following statements about the motion of the particle will always be true? Now we've got A and B where the particle is initially moving downwards and C and D where it is initially moving upwards. So let's look at A and B. To start with so if we're moving downwards then gravity is with us but the resistive force is against it so f equals m a is going to be equal to negative m k v plus m g so a is equal to negative k v plus g now either the speed is going to increase or it will decrease always so we can prove that wrong if we start with the terminal velocity because the terminal velocity occurs when acceleration is equal to zero. In other words, when zero is equal to negative kV plus g, kV is equal to g, v is equal to g over k. So if our initial velocity is g over k, it's neither going to increase nor decrease. It tells us that the initial speed of the particle is not zero, and this is definitely not zero. So a and v are out. Now with C and D, the particle is initially moving upwards and so the resistive force is against it and so is gravity. So we've got F is equal to MA will equal negative MKV take away MG. A is equal to negative KV take away G. Now in this case, the terminal velocity, zero is going to be equal to negative KV minus G kv is equal to g and so negative g sorry v is equal to negative g on k so what we want to do 
is solve this differential equation and we want to get an equation involving v and t find the limit as t approaches infinity and see whether we get this terminal velocity because that's what is being asked here either approaches the terminal speed or it doesn't okay so let's start a is equal to negative kv minus g so we want dv dt is equal to negative kv minus g let's flip it upside down dt dv is equal to negative 1 on kv plus g t is equal to negative integral of dv on kv plus g which is equal to negative ln kv plus g plus c and i've lost the one on k right at t is equal to zero the initial speed of the particle is not zero so we'll say initial velocity is v naught and so zero is equal to negative one on k ln k v naught plus g plus c c is equal to one on k ln k v naught plus g now joining that together we're going to get t is equal to negative one on k ln kv plus g on the top and kv naught plus g on the denominator all right bringing the k and the negative over is equal to this and raising both sides as powers of e we get this multiplying both sides by kv naught plus g nearly there making v the subject brackets e to the negative kt minus g and dividing by k we get v is equal to 1 over k kv naught plus g e to the minus kt minus g on k all right we need to find the limit as t approaches infinity of this thing. Now, if we put infinity in here, what's well, negative infinity? That is going, that whole thing there is going to go to zero. And so this will be equal to negative g on k, which is the terminal velocity. And so our answer is c. Okay, that's it for the multiple choice. Our next video, we're going to cover questions 11 to 13.